thank you everyone for joining. Good afternoon. And thank you for joining the National Lawyers Guild and CUNY Law Know, their, know Your Rights event. My name is Leah Gillespie. I'm a co-chair of the Palestine Subcommittee of the National Lawyers Guild. And I'm joined by my co-chair, Luna Martinez, and attorneys Naz Ahmed and Modisar Tulpa from CUNY Clear. The National Lawyers Guild, the NLB, is a progressive bar association with a mission to value people over profit. We are a collective of radical lawyers, legal workers, and law students who for the past 85 years have been devoted to supporting human rights and national liberation struggles, both here in the United States and internationally. We find ourselves at a juncture of history that will serve as a litmus test of our collective moral compass. Instead of calling for an immediate stop to the genocide of the 2.3 million Palestinians trapped in Gaza by a merciless regime bent on erasing their existence, policymakers and politicians are stoking hatred by calling for revenge. We are in a pivotal moment for Palestine's liberation, and we're happy to be able to provide this information and tools for your active engagement and support for Palestine's resistance to occupation and demand for freedom. The National Lawyers Guild has always supported the right to self-determination and liberation of occupied and oppressed people and stays steadfast in the support for Palestine now. Thank you for raising your voices, taking to the streets, engaging your electorate, providing legal advice and representation, and uplifting the voices of Palestinians, all of which are actively supporting Palestine's struggle for freedom. Today's political climate of knee-jerk support for military aggression is all too reminiscent of the racist and Islamophobic discourse that helped justify the illegal invasion of Iraq, the ongoing indefinite detentions at Guantanamo, the ubiquitous surveillance of Muslim communities and places of worship here in New York City and around the country, and the murder of over 1 million Iraqis. The early days of the so-called war on terror led to an all-out assault on freedom of speech, assembly, and press, and those who dared to speak out against the war were labeled as terrorist sympathizers. We refuse to allow the same kind of witch hunt against Palestinian solidarity activists. I would like to thank Naz Ahmed and Mudas Artopa for quickly coordinating with us to share their knowledge and expertise. As a CUNY Law alumnus myself and someone who participated in the clear clinic while in law school, I know that they're very well placed to be able to give us this information. With that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Naz and Mudasar to go at, to present this information to us and get us nice and prepared for all the activism that we're going to participate in moving forward. Thank you. Hi everyone. Um, so I can I try to get started here. Um, so as um, as Leah said, thank you for having us. Uh, my name is Naz Ahmad, she, her, I'm acting director of the CLEAR project. We're based at CUNY School of Law. We provide free legal services and support to communities and movements targeted by so-called national security law enforcement practices. Um, and I'm here with my colleague, Nadasar Topa, who's a staff attorney at the CLEAR project. We have done, historically since CLEAR's founding have done Know Your Rights workshops um, around the city and also nationally via Zoom and other platforms on uh, your rights while if law enforcement comes to your door or your rights while protesting. Um, we anticipated that this was the, the people signing up for this training were more going to be uh, lawyers or people who are involved in or who might want to share information with their communities and movements about how to respond to these issues. So some of the language is, is geared around, you are gonna be passing, the idea that you might be passing along this information to other folks, instead of you necessarily being the person who's anticipating having these issues. But we hope that this is a presentation that's helpful and useful for everybody. Um, some of you know and have experienced already, we're in a moment of increased repression on the US-based movement for Palestine liberation. Palestinian liberation. And so this is the specific context in which we're providing this um, training. We're going to have three parts. So first, we're going to discuss your rights when pro protesting or rights while protesting. Then we'll give some basic guidelines about how to deal with law enforcement in the protest context. And then we'll discuss what to do when, if or when law enforcement approaches you outside of the protest context, maybe at your home or otherwise on the street. 
Um, we're going to try to answer questions as they come. Um, if you have questions about your specific circumstances or a specific incident that happened to you, um, again, because this is being recorded, we encourage you to reach out to us directly and individually to protect your privacy or potential confidentiality. Um, and we, there are places during which we might solicit participation. So uh, look out for that. So um, just to ground us, many of you are likely aware and, and know of this already, but there's a long history in this country of law enforcement surveilling communities under the so-called guise of national security, um, including targeting communists in the 1920s, the 1950s, Black activists um, in the 60s and 70s, Clintel Pro, um, and and certain and Muslim Arab and South Asian communities after 9/11, and there's also a long history of surveillance and repression in response to events happening in Palestine. So, for example, in the early 70s, after uh, the Mun the events at the Munich Olympics, the U.S. government started Operation Boulder, which targeted. Arabs and Arab Americans um, under the guise of assuming that they had some sympathies with um, Palestine liberation movements. Um, so we're hoping that this training will form a piece of empowering you or the communities that you're part of or the movements that you're supporting to navig nav navigate this landscape. Something that we're gonna repeat overall, and I'm gonna say here um, to frame the conversation, so much of what we're about to share is what is law enforcement supposed to do on paper, what they're supposed to do. We all recognize that in reality, law enforcement often does things that they're not supposed to do. Our advice to you is always the foremost thing is to get out of whatever situation you're in as safely and as quickly as possible. And you will be the best judge or whoever is the individual you're advising is gonna be the best judge of that in the moment. And I think also one thing to acknowledge and recognize is that these moments are moments where people who are not otherwise galvanized, who are not otherwise connected to movements come and join, and maybe they just come and attend one protest. They're not part of organizing the protest. So we, we recognize that there, there's differences between people who might just be attending a one-off protest versus somebody who's actively involved, actively involved in, in planning direct action. So I'm gonna hand it over to Madhasar. Uh, thank you. Um, so starting with First Amendment rights, uh, we know that the First Amendment uh, protects us from government uh, repercussions or repercussions from the government for exercising um, our free speech. Um, it generally protects the right to engage in protest and political speech, but the government does have the authority to limit where and how political protests are made. Um, it's important to remember when we're advising communities and movements that the rights cover everyone in the United States, regardless of citizenship or immigration status. However, it's important to note that if arrested, non-citizens may face other complications and risks that citizens would not. That's true generally for arrests, but especially so in, in this type of heightened climate. Um, but at the end of the day, everyone on U.S. territory is protected by these rights. So what are you always within your right to do? Um, you're always within your right to march on a sidewalk so long as you do not block pedestrian traffic. Uh, organizers may need a permit for marches on the street or to protest in a city park. Um, in a public space, you have a right to photograph anything in plain view, which includes federal buildings and the police. But be sure to do that safely, meaning that if you are in a tense confrontation with a, a law enforcement officer at a protest, quickly pulling out a phone without saying anything may escalate the situation and, and may put yourself in, in danger. Under the law, police officers may not confiscate or demand to view your photographs or video without a warrant, nor may they delete data under any circumstances. However, in practice, sometimes they do, and you should not resist physically because of the risk of escalation, arrest, or violence towards you. You can exercise your First Amendment right to free speech. This means that most speech is protected under the U.S. Constitution as long as it does not incite or encourage imminent violence. Yelling, 
uh, attack and pointing at property or other people would be un understood as encouraging imminent violence. You also have the right to distribute pamphlets and flyers and hold up protest signs. Um, a quick note, however, on signs themselves, signs that also inc incite or encourage violence are not constitutionally protected and may in fact subject you to prosecution. And another non-obvious rule, and this is um, important to note that most of the rules that we're talking about here uh, are based upon local rules and are uh, most of our experiences in New York City. So it's possible, like it, like in New York, um, where a picket sign that's held up by a wood or metal stick could also be a crime. Um, signs also, uh, according to some local rules, cannot be attached to public property like uh, trees or light posts. What are you never legally allowed to do? Um, bring uh, illegal weapons, um, including concealed weapons and knives, so specifically in New York, knives longer than four inches are illegal. Butterfly knives, switchblades, these are all illegal weapons in New York. But we we don't um, we don't limit our advice to just illegal weapons. We suggest not bringing any weapons, and and that's the risk of the broader sort of legal ramifications that may result if you're uh, stopped or detained by law enforcement, if you are arrested, if there is um, sort of like a charge or allegation of um, some form of violence, having the weapon increases the penalties, increases the risk of criminal liability. Um, so our general precautionary advice on this point is not to bring any type of weapon or anything that could be even conceived or perceived as a weapon. Um, you're also not allowed to interfere with so-called legitimate police activity. Um, now, how does that define? Um, that's a a difficult thing to parse out. Um, the, the police will obviously take liberties with that terminology and um, and suggest that you know um, people who are uh, protesting on the side of the street and yelling at them are interfering. Uh, but generally speaking, you can monitor and observe police activity from a safe distance. Um, the, the thing that might cause you to get in trouble would be getting in the way of officers making arrests or officers trying to question people or, or literally like blocking their way. You're also not able to alter public or private property without a permit or permission from the owner. This includes wheat pasting, graffiti, and any other type of damage to property. Engaging in activity that is otherwise prohibited by law is also something you should not be doing at a protest. So for example, getting into any physical uh, altercations with counter protesters, We've seen local police departments uh, arrest people and, and, and actually criminally prosecute uh, for making physical contact with contra protesters. And that could mean um, directly using their bodies or even indirectly through the use of an object. Um, we heard of a case recently where someone was arrested um, because they caused a paper cut when they grabbed a, a piece of paper out of someone else's hand. So it's important to uh, be very mindful about that. Beyond not being allowed to do these things under the law, you may also face federal penalties for engaging in some of these activities. What also uh, can only be done with a permit is uh, sound ampl amplification. And again, this, this is New York specific advice. And so there may be different rules in the localities that you're working in or the communities um, that you're operating um, uh, or the communities that, that you are uh, working from. So sound amplification using loudspeakers or microphones, um, that, that in New York at least requires a permit and additionally marching in a public street. Uh, so that, that, that's not the sidewalk. So on the street itself, you do need a permit. So um, what are some things not to bring to a protest? Uh, and th these are things to minimize risk. And, and when we see, when we mean risk, we're not just talking about criminal prosecution here. We're talking about heightened surveillance, compromising sensitive and private information for yourself or other people in your community. Um, so the first thing is the, is your phone. Um, and so our advice is consider not bringing your phone to a protest. However, if you are gonna bring your phone, you should make sure that you keep it locked with a secure password, uh, set it to auto lock immediately. And the password itself um, should be a string of no less than 15 letters and numbers and stay away from obvious passwords like password or one, two, three, four, five, and do not share your password with anyone. 
Additionally, you, you should disable fingerprint and facial scan features on your phone. We advise this generally, not just because you're going to a protest, but because police can obtain a warrant forcing you to unlock your phone with your fingerprint or face ID, but they cannot get a warrant to force you to provide your device's password or code. We also advise turning off location services like GPS, NFC, AirDrop, um, Bluetooth, and Wi-Fi. Um, you should also be aware that sometimes photos and videos already have geographical data in them. If there's anything on your phone you don't want police to access, password protect those files on top of password protecting your phone. Make sure certain messaging apps, which may contain more sensitive info like Signal or WhatsApp are password protected. If there's anything at all on your phone you don't want the police to access, it is always best not to bring it. Additionally, uh, lots of protesters are live streaming, obviously to disseminate the protest itself or posting photos from the, pro from the protest publicly after the fact. It's important to try to take steps to block out protesters' faces so that they're not identifiable and when you are going to post um, a photo from a protest, uh, either uh, post a screenshot of the photo rather than the photo itself to avoid inadvertently sharing the metadata from the photo or strip the photo of all the metadata if you know how. The NYPD, um, again, where we operate, has a powerful facial recognition technology and they've been known to do shady things to lock down a match. So review your social media privacy settings um, as well before you go to a protest. Other electronic devices like computers or tablets should also not be brought with you to a protest. And as we said, um, any weapon, even legal weapons. So in New York, knives are not even uh, legal that are longer than four inches, but you could be um, working in a, a state or advising communities in a state that um, has open carry permits for even firearms, we would advise not bringing any weapons to uh, a protest. Additionally, illicit drugs. Um, so this includes substances that may be even legal in, in your location, but that are not federally recognized. So marijuana is legal in New York and in many states, but it's still not federally recognized. So we, wouldn't adv we would advise not bringing that. Additionally, anything that's politically or organizationally sensitive materials. So this can mean books, papers, notes, hard drives, USBs. So anything like, for example, if you have happen to have a notebook with all the list of members of an organization that's protesting for Palestine, um, and you bring that with you to a protest, now that's sensitive information and that may um, get into the hands of law enforcement. And so you wanna be mindful of what you're bringing with you to a protest. And with that, I will turn it back to Naz to talk about contact with law enforcement at protests. So we've said the word law enforcement quite a bit um, so far. Um, I think the chat is disabled, but if it's not, what do you think we mean when we say the words law enforcement? I'll enable it for this question. <laughs> Police, yeah. Um, any Anyone else? Cops? Border Patrol, yeah. Um, sheriffs, yeah, ICE, university, police, security guards, immigration, marshals. These are all, uh, yeah, if you want to disable the chat, we'll go. So, yeah, when we, when we say law enforcement, we're talking about your local police department. We're talking about the FBI. We might be talking about other federal law enforcement, like the Drug Enforcement Administration Agency, U.S. Customs and Border Protection, they're the border police that you might see at a land border or at an airport. Um, and the reason we um, we identify all of these is we want you to know who you're talking to, but for the most part, actually, the rules reply regardless of, of who ends up stopping you. Um, and the reason why we tell you to pay attention is so that we know if you contact a lawyer that it's important for you to that they can follow up with them. So the most important thing to remember if law enforcement stops you on the street, including at a protest, specifically at a protest, um, we ask, we we advise folks to say, to stay calm and to ask, am I free to leave? 
and to keep on saying this over and over again until you get an answer. If the officer says yes, walk away slowly or, you know, walk away calmly. If they don't, if they say anything else, anything other than, than yes, you should stay put. You have to wait for them to say, yes, you're free to leave. Um, and you're going to sound like a broken record. And you're, this might also, like, this goes against, like, a lot of our natural instincts when, when somebody approaches us and asks us a question to be helpful, to answer a question posed to us. Um, but the safest thing to do is not to answer, is to just keep on saying, am I free to leave? One second. Is my Word document blocking the PowerPoint? Okay, just making sure because I didn't catch that earlier, so I don't want to do that again. Um, so, yes. Um, in New York, if you're um, out in the street or in public, you don't have to provide your name or identification to a police officer if they stop you. However, again, this is specific to New York. Um, I think this might operate in other states as well. Um, if the if you don't, the police couldn't theoretically take you to a precinct to verify your identity if you do not give them a name. Um, if you do end up giving law enforcement ID, you we advise giving identification with the least amount of information on it, um, like a library card or a school ID. If you are not a citizen, we don't. We recommend not providing an ID that shows that you weren't born in the United States. We know that technically lawful permanent residents, people with green card holders, are required to carry proof of their permanent resident status. You should take that into mind when determining what ID to carry with you. And then also finally, if you're undocumented or otherwise at risk for deportation, uh, confirming your name to ICE, the immigration police, is enough for them to arrest you. So if you're undocumented, it's extra important to give police identification that uh, doesn't reveal your birthplace. Um, and also just keep this to keep this in mind when you're attending an action or event that might be heavily policed. The second thing is not to answer any questions. And our advice is to say, I won't answer any questions without a lawyer. You can even decide to be more deferential. Some people feel more comfortable saying something like, I'm sorry, I can't, I'm, I'm just sorry, I can't, I can't do that for you. Um, whatever feels more, most comfortable for you. Again, you're gonna you're gonna sound like a broken record. You're gonna sound like you're not understanding what the officer is saying, or that you're not listening. Just keep on repeating yourself. If you feel comfortable doing so, um, ask the officer for their information or a business card and badge number. And again, specific to New York, um, NYPD officers are required to provide their name, rank, command, and shield number as well as carry business cards with that information. Again, we all know this is how it's supposed to go, but it doesn't always go that way. Um, still, it's good to ask. So what if the situation escalates to, um, sorry, to arrest or detention? Um, the most important thing uh, in this, again, we try to advise people to the extent they can remember to do this is do not physically resist arrest. Again, to go back to this goes against like our natural instincts somehow, like in some in some ways, like our natural instinct, maybe if somebody stops us on the street and grabs us is might be to fight back or to run away because that's just how we do everything else in our life. So it's important in that moment to try to remember to stay as calm as possible and to not physically resist arrest. Um, again, in this circumstance, ask the officer for their information, ask what crime they are suspecting you of committing. But then other than that, do not say anything else to the officer or to anybody else, including people who have been arrested beside you, including people who might be in the same squad car as you, including people who might end up in the same precinct as you. You don't know who's next to you. Even if it is your best friend that you got arrested beside, you might be in a squad car that has recording on. Anything you say in those moments can end up being used against you. And then immediately and very clearly 
there are certain words that you have to say to ensure that they don't try to keep questioning you. You have to convey unequivocally that you want to, you're not going to speak to them without a lawyer present. So something that's like, oh, should I get a lawyer? Or is it a good idea for me to get a lawyer? Or something is not going to be enough. You have to say very specifically and clearly, I'm not going to speak to you without a lawyer present. I'm not going to answer. I'm not going to do anything without a lawyer present. This is important for legal reasons later on if there happens to be a case brought against you. If you happen to have the number of an attorney, maybe our number or the number of your local NLG chapter written down somewhere that's easily accessible, you can give that number. Um, and it's important to keep in mind also that um, law enforcement will sometimes try to goad people into responding to them, into saying things. So they might say something like, we saw you throwing rocks or something like that. And again, our immediate instinct when somebody says something to us that's not true is to correct them and to respond to them. But that's a trick on their part. Don't engage with them because again, that's information that they can use. Do not consent to a search. So if they're arresting you, they can search like what's called your person so they can make sure that you're not carrying a weapon on you. Um, they can search in your, like anything that you can reach into like your pockets or a backpack to make sure that uh, you don't have any weapons on you. But otherwise, um, don't physically resist the search, but also important for legal sake later on, if again, if there's a case to say loudly, I don't consent to the search. Um, I don't know how much this operates outside of New York, but also don't consent to DNA collection. Sometimes they'll try to, act, they'll like be open and direct with you and ask for it directly. And other times they will, they're, 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 they might offer you like a drink or something and then take the soda can and use that to collect your DNA. And then finally, do not sign any papers or answer any, like I said before, answer any questions without a lawyer present. Um, Sometimes uh, cops will try to get you to sign something that's is, is saying like, oh, I'm giving up my, what are called my Miranda rights, meaning like I'm giving up my right to insist that I don't have to speak to them without a lawyer present. Sometimes they'll say, oh, but like, I just need you to sign that I read you your rights. You don't even have to sign that. Um, so I think now Modesta and I are going to do a role play where um, I play a law enforcement officer that stops him on the street. Modester is somebody attending a protest. Are we ready? Um, okay. Hey, stop right there. Am I under arrest? I told you to stop. But am I free to leave? What are you doing? We're marching on a public sidewalk. We're not using sound application and we don't need a permit. Am I free to leave? I saw you throw a rock. Am I free to leave? Why were you throwing rocks? Am I free to leave? What's that in your hand? Is that your phone? Give me your phone. I didn't bring my phone. Am I free to leave? You didn't bring a phone? I did not bring my phone. Am I free to leave? That's unbelievable. You're lying to me. Am I free to leave or am I being detained? I guess you can go. Okay, so debrief. Uh, what went well in this interaction? I'm enabling the chat so everyone can respond. Constantly saying, am I free to leave? Insisted on clarity of de detention, persistency. Yes, he kept on saying, am I free to leave? Am I free to leave? avoiding questions, asked why he was being stopped, not providing unnecessary info. Was there something that he did provide that he didn't necessarily need to provide? Yes, he answered the question of, I have a phone. Um, so he didn't need to answer that question. He didn't need to tell the officer like, hey, this thing that's in my hand is not a phone. Like he didn't need, he didn't need to offer to the officer, this, I don't have a phone on me. He could have said something else about what happened, or he could have just, in response to that question, said, "I'm am I free to leave? Because very often, and we'll go over this later, if they're asking for your permission, they need it. And sometimes it's not going to sound like they're asking for your permission. It's going to sound like they're telling you what to do, but you don't necessarily have to do it. 
Um, I think a lot of people have asked, like, what happens if it escalates? What if the cop reaches for your phone? What if they grab you? The most important thing, again, in this moment is we want you to get out of this as safely and as quickly as possible. We want whoever you're advising to get out of this as safely and quickly as possible. So to the extent that you can remember to do it in the moment and feel calm enough to do it is not to resist arrest um, and not to like try to physically grab whatever the officer has grabbed from you back from them. Um, that's really important. We want to avoid people getting potential charges for like arresting, resisting arrest or something like that. Um, officers aren't supposed to like take your phone out of your hand and like go through your photos, for example, or delete stuff from your phone. Again, we know that they often do things that they're not supposed to do, but those are, those are things that they're not, they're theoretically not supposed to do. Um, I think there's a question, um, it was just this in the police officer context. Yeah, this is, this is applicable to dealing with any officer, um, your your rights at the border are different. And so that's a separate presentation on like how to handle searches and questioning at a land border or at an airport because your quote unquote like what's called your the the courts have said like your expectation of privacy is different at those places. And so what you are supposed to do is different. Um but like if another person of another like an FBI person or agent or an ICE agent or whoever stopped you on the street and did the same thing your same rights would apply the same things that you would say would apply um okay so oh question was of law enforcement taking DNA from protests I'm not, I haven't heard of that specifically, but we know that like the NYPD has done that in other contexts when other people have gotten arrested. So this is why we're, we're just trying to be as like thorough um, as possible. And um, at CBP, in terms of CBP taking data, DNA at the border, um, that's like a whole other thing that we could get into, but it's very complicated, I think. Um, okay. So, Madhusar, do you want to do the second role play now, I think, then? Sure. Um, are we going to make an attendee um, volunteer? Or, or Luna? Or Luna, Leah? would you feel comfortable? Um, sure, but, but Leah, can you then monitor the chat? Or do you want to do it and then I monitor the chat? Oh, I don't know if she's doing Okay. Sounds good. Okay. Hey, stop right there. Do you want me to be? Yeah, you're the protester. Yeah. We want you to, to do it the right way. The, uh, okay. Hey, stop um, right there. Oh. Am I free to leave? Uh, I told you to stop. I have a few questions for you. What are am you doing I here? Am I free to leave? Well, what are you doing am here? Am I free I'm... to leave? Well, hold up, listen, we can do this the easy way. We can do this the hard way. I have a few questions. I just need to know why, what you're doing here, who you came with. Am I being detained or am I free to leave? Well, listen, look, I just have a few questions. This will go really quickly. If you just answer my questions, you'll be on your way. You just you tell just me who tell you me came with. you me if I'm with? free to leave? All right. Well, what do you have on you there? I, uh, do I see, do I see a weapon? I'm not answering any questions without an attorney. Am I free to leave? All right, you're free to leave. Great. So what went well in this scenario? Yeah, there's a good question from one of the uh, one of the attendees. If a cop stops you and do you ask, am I free to leave immediately? It, it seems unnatural. And a lot of the advice that we're giving here seems unnatural, right? Like being uncooperative generally goes against human nature. Resisting talking to someone goes against human nature. And that's one of the things that unfortunately law enforcement plays on, right? Like this is these are natural human instincts to be responsive, to listen, to try to try to understand one another. And uh, the fact of the matter is, is just given the the power disparity that exists, that it's in your best interest to just clearly assert your right. And 
and play the game or not the game, I should say, play, play the, um, play the cards that you're dealt, right? Which is that you have the right to, to ask, are you being detained? And if you are not being detained, you can, you can leave that situation. And so you need to get a clear yes or no from them. If they say no, and you are being detained, uh, sorry, if they say you are not being detained, you leave. And if they say yes, then you stay put and you stay quiet, uh, waiting until they let you go. Yeah, clear and consistent, asked if I'm being detained, am I free to leave? Yes, you remain calm and proactive. Um, what is the difference between am I being detained? Am I free to leave? They're they're both the same. They mean the same thing. It just it's confirming whether the law enforcement officer is is uh, subjecting you to um, what's called a, a, a detention. Okay, that was great. Okay, um, so we're gonna move on uh, to general law enforcement encounters. Uh, so these are talking about uh, outside of the protest context. Mm -hmm. So um, why do you think law enforcement questions people? And again, this is outside the context of protests. Like let's say if they're coming to visit you at your home or your place of business, why might law enforcement be approaching people for questioning? To arrest them? Suspicion, yeah. Intel gathering, yeah, yeah. Break up future protest, investigation. To intimidate, yes. Yeah, racial profiling, catch you off guard and make you provide info. Yeah, all of these are, are good answers. So the reasons why law enforcement um, questions people is they, they may be approaching someone because they suspect that they're involved in some crime. Um, they may think uh, that that person knows about a crime that they're investigating. But much of the time, and most of the time, and I think all of the answers that we've seen in um, from, from the attendees have, have confirmed, it's most of the time is just fishing for information without any particular suspicion of criminal activity, intelligence gathering. And in the context of movement repression or counterinsurgency that we talked about earlier, uh, they may be seeking intelligence on movements, key high profile organizers and inter organizational practices. And, you know, this this is important to note because you may think you have nothing to hide. So there's no harm in talking with law enforcement. However, we have found that it opens the door to problems for not just you, uh, but your family and your community and the movements that you're you're working in. Uh, you may think that answering questions, officers questions will make them go away. But in our experience, we have found that once they know you're willing to talk, they will keep coming back to you because they've they've identified you now as a source of information on your community. Just to give you a few examples of the kinds of things you might be asked by law enforcement or organizers might be asked by, uh, by law enforcement. What do you think about what is going on in Gaza? Do you know anyone in Gaza? Do you know anyone in Hamas? What do you think about Hamas? Do you condone armed resistance? Do you know anyone in uh, NLG, are you a member of NLG? What kind of activities do these groups do? Um, do you know, insert uh, any name of um, in your organization, right? So um, when we're giving advice, we try to frame why it's important not to speak to law enforcement without a lawyer present. And some of you may already know this, but let's name these consequences very explicitly. If the FBI comes to your door or stops you on the street to ask you questions, why is it better not to speak to them unless your lawyer is present with you? They lie, yes, they can incriminate you. They could lie about what you said, what you say or do, yes. Anything else? Yes, they can use anything against you if you are prosecuted. Anything can and will be used against you. You might accidentally reveal information that can be used against you or your community. Excellent. Yeah, and so we we try to categorize uh, for you know the communities that we uh, present these workshops uh, to um, the categories of consequences as criminal consequences, potential immigration consequences, and then unknown consequences and. On the criminal side, 
how many of you think it's a crime to lie to law enforcement? And I, I know we don't have a raise hand function, or at least I don't think we do, but maybe just type it out in the chat if you think it is a crime to lie to law enforcement. It's, yep. Yeah. Uh, and how many of you think it's a crime for law enforcement to lie to you? Yep, not a crime. <laughs> yeah. So it this is a, a very, very important piece of information that we try to emphasize when we're um, advising and uh, helping train communities and movements. The power disparity is vast, right? You're in a position where you cannot say anything factually inaccurate, but they can literally manipulate and conjure up things for the sake of getting you to say something. It is not a safe situation to be in, right? So um, they can lie to you, but you can't lie to them. And, and that means that, you know, even if you misremember something or forget, they could turn around and use that against you. Um, and the other thing is law enforcement, they know the law better than you do. Well, maybe not this audience because we have like, law students and attorneys, but um, but for most people, yeah, they do know the law better than they do. And, and if, if you think they, you have done nothing wrong, they can still find something to use against you. There are also potential immigration consequences. Um, and this is important, again, for communities that um, have a precarious um, citizenship status or immigration status. If you or wh whoever you are speaking about is not a U.S. citizen, it could have immigration consequences for them or for you. Um, so just to give some examples, any slight inconsistency between what you tell law enforcement and what they have from your prior applications for immigration benefits can be used to pressure you or it can be used to deny someone an immigration benefit or be used against them in deportation proceedings. There are also unknown consequences. So you might unknowingly get yourself or others into trouble. And you may think that you're not saying anything that's incriminating, but it fits, it helps uh, uh, add a piece of the puzzle in a picture that they're painting to prosecute someone else. So you don't know what they're investigating. And to the extent that they're activists and organizers in the audience, you represent your movement. So other information about organizers, your organization and any larger structure like a national body could be compromised. The fact is we simply don't know why law enforcement is asking questions, how they're going to report the info we give them or how they might use it in the future. The other thing is they will write down what they think you said. They're not recording these conversations, right? Or at least the vast majority of the time they're not. And their version of what happened, even if it is missing facts, will probably be presumed to be true if it's ever taken before a court. And that's why the best thing you can say is nothing. And I will turn it back to Nas uh, to go over some guidelines to remember or to advise uh, when encountering law enforcement outside of the protest context. Thanks. So we're gonna go over three golden rules that we advise folks to keep in mind. Um, and this is, I'm gonna start off specifically what to do if law enforcement approaches you at your home. And again, just to provide some context for this, like a lot of our work stems from people having the FBI show up at their home and they're asking them the kinds of questions that Magusta was talking about, where it's obvious they're not investigating a crime, they're just fishing for information. So the first golden rule is do not open the door. Um, there's only two ways law enforcement uh, should be can get into your home. One is with a valid search warrant, and the, the second is with your permission. So some things to say if they're knocking on your they're not somebody knocks on your door and you go to the door and you can somehow see who's out there and they announce themselves as law enforcement, say, can I see your ID? Please leave your business card or phone number. Do you have a warrant? Um um, one thing to keep in mind um, in this is sometimes people will, oh, they, they realize that it's law enforcement at the door and instead of letting them in, they'll close the door behind them. They'll step outside and close the door behind them. We also want to avoid a situation where law enforcement like basically sticks their like leg or foot in and, and gets in and tries to stay in your house and tries to question you. Um, the important thing to say if that happens is I do not consent to you coming into my house or I do not consent to you coming inside and I do not consent to a search. Um, 
I'm not going to spend too much time on warrants, but, and so here's a, an example of a valid search warrant. There are a few things to keep, to look out for if they say that they have a warrant. One is address. So this has the address of the, the place that's about to be searched, your name or the name of the business that is about to be searched, a date, the date of the judge's signature and information about how long the, sorry, the warrant can be executed for and a judge's signature. So you'll see here um, that this says there's a date on it and it says that the warrant has to be executed within 14 days of that date. You'll see here that it says judge's signature, that's the judge's signature and then below printed honorable um, Theodore H. Katz. This is just an example, I'm not picking on this judge, but um, that this is one way to tell like, Sometimes people ask, how am I gonna know if it's a judge who signed it? Usually they'll have something there that indicates this is a judge's signature, it's being issued by a judge. This is an example of an ICE warrant. This is not a warrant that allows ICE to enter your home. And you can tell it's different from a valid search warrant because at the top it says US Department of Homeland Security and it doesn't have a judge's name anywhere on it. It doesn't have a judge's signature on it. This does not allow them to enter your home. So if they show up and it looks like this is the thing that they have, you do not have to let them in your house. So the first, again, most important thing, the safest, the way to keep you, whoever else is in the house safest is do not open the door. The second golden rule is do not speak to law enforcement without a lawyer present. You can say any variation of, I will not answer any questions without a lawyer present, or I'll not answer any questions without my lawyer present. I will have my lawyer call you, or I will have a lawyer call you. I'm sorry, I can't, I can't speak to you. I went to this training, they told me I don't have, I, I shouldn't talk to you without a lawyer, so I need to get a lawyer. Whatever you feel comfortable saying in that moment, just to convey to them, I'm not going to speak to you without a lawyer present. And then the other thing to keep in mind, like I said, again, I've said this before, and I'll keep on saying this, repeat, repeat, repeat. They may, they're not gonna necessarily go away the first time you say that. They're not just gonna like walk away the first time you say that, so be prepared to repeat yourself. The third golden rule is do not consent to a search. And you can say this just very lo like loudly and clearly, I do not consent to a search. I do not give permission for you to search. This is important. Maybe they ended up in your home, you forgot about the rules or you were nervous, you let them in and then they started looking around. You can say this. If you got nervous and you let them in and you started answering their questions and then you happen to remember, oh yeah, like I don't need to answer these questions, you can always stop and say, okay, I no longer want to speak to you without a lawyer present, please leave my home, I don't consent to a search. And one of the reasons that we emphasize this, again, this is like, so it sort of just has to do with like legal processes and the legal system, is that if they've come into your home without a warrant and they're, they're looking for something and they find something that they want to use against you. If you tell them, I didn't give permission for them to search, you tell your, and they want to use it in a case against you, you can tell that to your lawyer and your lawyer can help you try to find a way to, to say, oh, they didn't give permission for, for the search. So whatever the law enforcement found at that incident or that event can't be used against them. So I um, just want to make sure that... Also important here is to ask them to provide uh, like a business card or a phone number so that if you get in touch with a lawyer, that lawyer can follow up with them. And we're always here to provide support to people who are approached for questioning in this matter. One small thing, if you are at home, you're not required to even confirm your name or provide ID. So, um, and this is especially important for people who live in households with members who have different uh, immigration statuses. But Esther and I are gonna do another role play. Um, so I, oh, Melissa gets to be the law enforcement officer this time. Yay. Um, okay. Knock, knock, knock. Hi, uh, who's there? Hi, are you Nas? Yes, I am. Who is who's this? Hi, Nas. I'm from the FBI. May I come in and ask you a few questions? Uh, sure. What's this about? 
well, I just wanted to talk to you about what's happening in Israel and Palestine this week. What, what, what do you make of what's going on? I mean, it's it's really sad. Uh, you know, I'm I have uh, Palestinian friends and family, so my heart is breaking for Gaza. Do you know people in Gaza? Uh, yeah, sort of. I mean, I'm in touch with a few people there, like a journalist, and I have some dis distant relatives who live there. And how often are you in touch with them? Um, I mean, obviously this week, like, I've tried to be more in touch with them. It's difficult with the electricity and everything. And are they members of Hamas? No, they're just, you know, people living in Gaza. Okay. Well, what do you think of Hamas? Uh, I'm not sure why you're asked, like, why does my opinion of Hamas matter? Well, I know you're active with some political groups in New York City, and we've gotten some concerning reports of pro-Hamas activity and rallies. Are, are you involved in those? I'm I'm part of some independent organizations standing with Palestine. Well, do you know it's a crime to lie to a federal agent? Uh, I don't know. Do you mind if I look around? I guess not. Okay. So, uh, what could I have done differently? Everything. <laughs> yeah, not answered questions. I let him in. Um, not consenting to a search. Ask for a lawyer. Yeah, all of those things. I opened the door. I didn't ask for ID or business card. I didn't say anything about a lawyer. I answered these questions. Um, and I let I basically gave this person permission to search, even though I didn't feel like I was giving that giving him permission. Like I felt like, well, you're here. Like, am I allowed to say no? But it that will be construed as as giving permission to search. Um so yeah, again, to go over this, um, the important things are, sorry, don't open the door. So you can say, please leave your business card. Do not submit to questioning without a law enforcement, without a lawyer present, sorry. Um, I will not answer any questions without a lawyer and do not consent to a search. Um, so I think just some other final things that we wanted to share, I think this is middle search. Thanks. Um, so other important uh, considerations. Um, so how to advise individuals. Um, we, we often tell um, the audiences or you know the communities that we speak to that you have to be ready to repeat yourself. Um, and remember that the advice we're giving goes against most of our socialization instincts to to uh, answer questions put to us, to correct something untrue, to to want to be to want to be helpful. So you will sound like you're not listening or understanding what law enforcement is saying, and and that's okay. That's why practice is important, and that's why we try to practice this as well. Um, if they are asking for your permission, they need it, and that's also another like. Uh, important sort of like rule of thumb for people to remember when they're dealing with law enforcement. Um, and the other thing is that asking for permission will not always sound like they're asking. It may sound like an order, right? Open the door, pop pop your trunk, right? And and that is an important follow-up question. Are you asking for my permission to do so? Or is that uh, a lawful order? Are you, are you saying, if I don't do that, I will be arrested? You have a lot more power in these situations than you probably realize, especially when you're at home. Law enforcement knows that you are under no obligation to speak to them. It's also important to be truthful. It is way worse to provide untrue information than not to speak at all. Remember, it is a crime to lie to a federal law enforcement agent. If you or the person you're advising is undocumented or otherwise at risk for deportation, we strongly recommend consulting an attorney if any of these situations arise, and we're available uh, at Clear to consult for free of charge. The goal is to stay calm and get out of the situation unharmed, and so we also encourage and advise um, people that we're um, engaging in with these workshops to, to use their better judgment about personal safety and 
the risk of escalation and things of that nature when dealing with law enforcement, because the rules are, um, as we all know, um, what should happen. And we know that law enforcement often does not comply with the law itself. And so, um, you know, emphasizing agency and personal safety is also very important. I just want to emphasize something. Somebody asked this question, so I want everyone to know it. Um, the question was, if they come to your home with a search warrant and they're in your house, do you have to answer their questions? And the answer is absolutely. You do not have to answer their questions. That Even more important at that point, not to answer their questions. Even questions that are like, is this your phone? Or are these your keys? You don't have to answer those questions. And oftentimes it will be to your, you know, uh, It'll be better for you if you don't answer those questions. Um, okay, I'm, I'm gonna try to answer some other questions that are up here. Um, are you able to confirm which messaging platforms are safest? So, and somebody will type this as well. So Signal and WhatsApp use are both what are called end-to-end -end encrypted, meaning that they that the messaging the the content of what is being shared between you and another person is safe from both when it's on your device when it's leaving your device to go to the other person's device and when it's on the other person's device they use the same um uh encryption protocol the only difference is that whatsapp is owned by meta and so there's more metadata collected by meta that they can share with law enforcement if law enforcement asks for it. So that's the only reason that we suggest still prioritizing using Signal over WhatsApp. Um, another question was, at a protest, is it smart to start speaking another language or is that just to make them think we're undocumented even if we're not? I would only recommend speaking another language if that's the best language that you communicate in. I would not try to use another language to um, make them think that you don't understand what's going on. I would not advise that. Um, is there an encryption service for email and sharing important information for actions? There are a lot of different encryption services. There's um, a lot of people use CryptPad, for example, instead of using Google Docs. Um, there are places that hold your information, kind of like Google Drive, but encrypted and, and they don't um, they don't have direct access to them. And their servers, they're based in another country. And so if they get an order from law enforcement here, they're not necessarily going to comply with it. So there's a service called Treasurit. There are lots of different services out there. So it's hard for me to recommend like a specific one. But I would just one do some do some searching on the internet about this, and then also speak to other people that you might be organizing with about ways to keep your movement safe. Okay, there's another question in here which I'm not entirely sure how to answer, which is if you're in a two party consent state, meaning that if you are recording something, both people who might be recorded need to give permission for that conversation or whatever to be recorded. The question is, you know, I'm wondering if this, we that, that there might be exceptions for filming the police. And I'm one, wondering if this includes less obvious methods of recording. I actually don't know the answer to this question. I don't know if somebody else knows the answer to this, this question. Um, yeah. I guess nobody else knows the answer to this question. No, I, it's very state by state. So what I yeah. did is that I posted, if you check the Q&A, which we will also post, I posted the ACLU has know your rights um, or interactions with law enforcement specific to each state. So I posted that. I, I will post it again in the chat so everyone has it. And then again, if you contact your NLG chapter locally, which we have all over the country, you can also have you know your rights specific to your jurisdiction. For example, there are jurisdictions where you need to tell the police just your name. 
um, whereas in other places you don't. So we do advise that you check those resources specific to your own state, and I'm going to post them again in the chat. Yes, and then there's another question in the chat. Do you do you recommend any sites or places to find lawyers like you all in other states? Um, so yeah, there there might be an NLG chapter in your state. Um, particularly with respect to this concern about being approached by FBI for questioning. Um, a lot of, there are a lot of care chapters around the country that support particularly Muslim communities who have faced um, this kind of issue. Those are, are places to um, reach out to. Also, like, even though we're based in New York, we often represent and assist people who are based outside of New York. So you can feel free to contact us on, us in the first instance. We provide free legal services. We might be able to connect you with a lawyer who may also be able to pro provide free legal services or maybe as low bono in the state that you live in if that's necessary. That went really quickly compared to our others, but maybe that's because we're answering the questions that they're coming instead of being interrupted. Um, are there any other questions? We really appreciate like all your time and your attendance and, and participation and appreciate your questions because sometimes we don't know the answer and it helps us to figure out what we should go and figure out the answer to to advise folks. Leah or Luna, did, is there anything else you want to add? I just want to thank everyone for attending. Um, there have been a lot of Know Your Rights trainings offered by um, CUNY Clear. And um, I know there was a local NLG NYC Know Your Rights given this week, and there will be more moving forward. So please keep track of socials and our websites so that we can um, make sure you get the information about any other trainings available. Um, the NLG also um, has an email on our website that you can contact us if you need to. And as you can see, CUNY Clear's information is on the screen. Um, so I just wanna thank everyone for coming and have a great rest of your day. And I hope to see people out um, in the streets tomorrow. And There's oh, just a couple of questions Sorry, in the chat. There's a couple I'm, more questions. Yeah, oh, sure, no problem. Sorry. Okay, so... Can't, so one question, if you have an interview with law, with media, can law enforcement use that? They can, so I want to like think about it in the way of anything that's out there publicly that you have said that law enforcement can attribute to you can be used against you. That doesn't mean that like what you are saying itself is a crime, right? But But if they end up finding something else that you have done, for example, they might use what you have said to the media as uh, as evidence of like, oh, this was this person's intentions, for example. So like, let's say something happens at a protest, you get arrested for something at that protest and you happen to speak to media beforehand. They might use what you what are recorded saying to media as like evidence of whatever your intent was in showing up at that protest. The other thing is um, there's a slight risk to this is that like law enforcement, like particularly the FBI might use what, what they find in, in public media as an excuse to come and question you and say, hey, what were you talking about when you gave that interview? Um, question was, there's another question, if law enforcement has a warrant to enter the home, am I obligated to open safes or assist them in any way, or are they allowed to just come in and check what's directly visible? So the the warrant should list out what evidence, what what they're looking for, or sort of like evidence of what crime they're looking for. So they might be saying like, oh, we're looking for this like TV that you stole. So the TV can't fit in something that's like a cabinet drawer, right? So they can't be looking in the cabinet drawer for a TV that you potentially stole. Um, I don't believe, I don't know the answer to the question of whether you are obligated to like unlock something for them. They might ask you to, but so for example, going back to the, yeah, so I, not sure about that. I might pivot to Madhusar. I don't know if you know the answer to that question. I don't. I think the the only um, sort of maybe analogous situation that we've we have dealt with or we have like looked into is uh, related to warrants related to like your electronic devices. And so, 
law enforcement could theoretically require you to like provide a thumbprint or give your like, um, you know, yeah, give your thumbprint to unlock a phone if, if the warrant, if the judge has signed off on that. And so just conceivably speaking, like, you know, it's possible that if the type of lock mechanism is of the same nature that is biometric based, that they could demand that from you. Um, however, uh, courts have not extended that privilege to, uh, or extended that um, access to law enforcement with respect to um, like alphanumeric passcodes. And so if the safe is based off of that, I would imagine, and it's not like we, ha we haven't confronted this question directly, but I would imagine that the same sort of rule would apply that like law enforcement can compel you to provide or state what your code is to your safe. Yes. I see some questions that are just generally on the theme of employment and like, what can I be fired for? Will this affect my future employment prospects? We are not employment lawyers. We're not, we don't have much expertise in that area. And I'm, I think Luna is trying to see if Pal Legal will do an, a future training that covers academic and employment related consequences for this. I think overall, just generally like advice on this is, if you happen to get arrested, like that is something that may come up if you need a background check for your work. So I would imagine like if you happen to be working for, with kids, that that is something that would come up. I don't know how much it might actually affect your ability to get employment. Um, and then, okay, so those are those questions. Oh, another question, how should minors interact with law enforcement? The most important piece of advice I would recommend sharing with your kids or your your relatives that are minors or whoever that you care about that is under the age of 18 is that if they come into any contact with law enforcement to always insist that they have a parent or other responsible adult present with them before they answer any questions. That's the most basic piece of advice I would give and advise to folks to remind children. And it's even, as you can imagine, harder for children or somebody who's that young, they're used to like following authority. So they may not feel like they have the ability to ask for that, or they might feel like, oh, they, these people aren't going to wait for my, uh, my parent to show up. That's okay. Just keep on reminding them that they shouldn't talk to law enforcement without a parent or a responsible adult present. Um, if an officer wants to search us, are we allowed to ask if an officer of the opposite gender does in, instead. Um, I am aware that in the in the airport context, you can usually ask for an officer of the same gender to search you. Um, and I would anticipate that in some local police departments, maybe not all, they may be uh, sensitive to concerns that women who wear hijab, for example, maybe should be searched by uh, women officers. Um, I think you can ask, I don't know if they're required to follow that request. Um, is profanity against law enforcement a crime? Um, I, don't, I don't believe like just saying something like the F word and then the police uh, is something that's gonna constitute a crime and all of this is is said to go back to what we've been talking about like a lot of this is we want to reduce your risk level and part of the reason we might suggest not saying things like that is because if something happens later on down the line they can use all of that stuff to form a picture of like what your intent was what your purpose was uh question are can we confront an officer if they are attempting to search something that is not listed on the warrant um I would say in that in that circumstance, I would say, I would just insist and repeat, I don't consent to you searching that part of the house. I don't believe that that part of the house or this area is covered by your search warrant and I'm not consenting to it. Um, and this is where maybe if you have a one party consent state and it's safe for you to like be recording this interaction uh, might be useful later on, particularly for whatever attorney that you um, come into contact with. Okay. Um, somebody, sorry, I, I think we didn't answer this, but uh, what rights do folks have when expressing their views within within private arenas? I don't know the full extent of this. My understanding is that stadiums, arenas, concert halls, theaters, 
um, they have really broad discretion basically to ask to enforce that people leave. Um, so it's hard, it's hard for me to say like one way or the other on this, but I don't know if somebody else has, has different advice. And do minors have a legal right to have a parent guardian with them for questioning? I believe that, um, that they, uh, it's, uh, yes, they, they do. Um, whether it's like an enforceable right is a, is a different question. So that's why we're saying like you, there are things that you should always ask for, even if you're not necessarily sure that they're going to give it to you. Um, I don't know that we have any resources on things in writing that they consider inciting violence versus free speech. Um, this is something that sometimes comes down to context and sometimes comes down to how uh, the prosecutor might be interpreting certain things. Um, some of you might have read, for example, the, the RICO indictment brought against Stop Cop, Stop Cop City protesters. And a lot of that indictment is talks about things that are relatively like average or within protest communities, within communities that are protesting police violence, like their description of mutual aid and anarchism and things like that. Is there information that cannot be distributed via pamphlets during protest actions? That's, I don't know. So I would say that there's probably stuff that is not advisable to distribute during protests or actions, like details about what your plans are, or things like that, or um, things that things that um, that uh, re reveal. Yeah, it's, it's hard for me to say honestly that question. I don't know, Mister, if you want to add that, answer that. Um, no, I don't think I don't think there's much to add. I, I would just um, suggest as well um, with respect to like the question that was asked previously regarding um, like what could be considered inciting violence. Now, it may not help clearly define like what is inciting violence and what isn't like what speech is protected or, or is not. But uh, just as like a case study clear in partnership with the Movement for Black Lives did um, a study that I, I helped co-author um, on federalization of like protest related charges that resulted in the uprising from 20, the summer of 2020, uh, 2020. and um, within there, there were cases that involved similar things like what's happening in Cop City, and it may help illuminate, I mean, so just like the guiding post here is like, they're not going to say that that statement itself in isolation was the crime, right? They generally are not going to rely on something that seems innocuous or just seems generally like um, sort of um, uh, harshly critical of the police state or, or, or very supportive of movements of liberation. It's that piece together with a lot of other things where they craft this like narrative and and allegations that there's like this wider conspiracy and then that's like the basis where those statements come into play and then unfortunately um could you know are, are used against folks I don't know the answer to that about gas masks. I, I I mean, given what happened during COVID, I think there were a lot of folks who were wearing like respirators essentially, right? When they were going out. So I would imagine that that itself is not a crime. Um, there has been the question more generally about like face coverings and whether law enforcement can like demand you remove them. Um, again, that is like a bit of a gray area. Generally speaking, it doesn't seem like they would have the right to just demand that unless there's some like local, you know, ordinance or state rule uh, prohibiting like having a face covering in public spaces or in certain spaces. Like it could be that they have a rule regarding that in like a federal building or some other location. Um, but that answer is different once you are detained or once you are arrested, right? And so um, some, um, you know, uh, state and city governments or, uh, uh, you know, even police agencies, like even the NYPD, as a result of litigation, like has agreed to like some sort of like 
process or limitation on like when people have to like when like a Muslim woman might have to remove her hijab. She only has to remove it in front of like an officer of the same gender and un only under certain circumstances. Um, obviously, those are like the guideposts and they're not like legally enforceable. But the idea is that, you know, um, some agencies have set up sort of like rules regarding things like that. Just a reminder that Palestine Legal will be hosting a separate Know Your Rights training on Monday. So three days from now, please follow Palestine Legal. Um, you will be able to see on their social media a link to that. It will deal about school issues. If any of you all are at school, or people who are at school are advising people who are in school and are dealing with any sort of issues related to their political advocacy these days, um, that's going to be covered on Monday. And then within the NLG, we are working on putting together a separate event to talk about employment issues as well, which have come up a lot. And there were a lot of questions about that. So we're putting together some employment attorneys who can talk about employment retaliation and concerns that people I think there are a couple, just a couple other things. Um, one was a question about the patriarch's role in this context. I am not really sure just how directly it, it plays within or affects your rights at a protest. So I, I, I'm not sure that I can add anything on that. Another question is at a street protest, are cops required to like quote unquote, give you a chance to leave the protest or street before getting arrested or can they go ahead and arrest when they deem it is unlawful? Uh, I don't believe that they're required. They may often do this. Um, they have a lot of discretion basically on the street to decide what how they're going to deal with something. Um, so you there may be situations where you've seen that they do that and then there may be situations where they go ahead right ahead and just like arrest people without giving them any kind of warning. Um, it's it's hard to say in advance like which of those scenarios will will be the one that you encounter. All right, I think I think that's it. Thank you so much again for your time and for your attendance and NLG for hosting us. We really appreciate Leah and Luna for inviting us and we're here as resources um, and um, hopefully you can share this information with uh, your communities and the people you care about to keep them safe. Thank you everyone. I appreciate you all being here tonight. Bye.